welcome to today's episode of Engineering Legends. Instead of looking on how we trample the earth, I was more interested in how we fix things. And that's been sort of my career path for the last uh, 20 or 30 years anyway. I'm Kelly Rogers, and I'm here with Tiffany Long. And in today's world of social media, we are bombarded with images at an unprecedented pace. And photographs really connect us to people, places, feelings, and stories. And in the water wastewater business, it's sometimes really hard to see the beauty in our infrastructure and to evoke those positive feelings. In fact, usually they're negative. Um, particularly wastewater, where someone who isn't in the industry probably doesn't think that a treatment facility is beautiful or awe-inspiring. And because of that predisposition, it's really unusual for someone to really see the beauty and understand the impact, which is why I'm super excited about today's guest. I really am too. Uh, Today we are joined by Brad Temkin. He's an American photographer who is known for using his photos to document human impact on landscapes. Brad teaches photography at Columbia College Chicago, and his photographs have been featured in numerous magazines including Time, European Photography, Aperture, and Black and White. And he has work included in permanent collections at the Art Institute of Chicago and the Museum of Contemporary Photography. Brad has published numerous books showcasing his photography, and for this episode of Engineering Legends, we're going to speak with him about his most recent book, The State of Water, published in 2019 by Radius Books. This book features a collection of truly stunning images of the processes and structures that facilitate the movement of the water cycle, including drinking water, runoff, and wastewater. He received a Guggenheim Fellowship for this work, which was featured in exhibitions at the Field Museum in Chicago in 2019 and at the Houston Museum of Natural Science in 2020 and 2021. After seeing his work, we became interested in knowing a little more about what hit drives him and how he found his way to photographing the plants and infrastructure that we are so familiar with in our industry. So necessary, but often hidden. Welcome to the show, Brad. Why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself? So I started photographing as a kid um, in high school, and I found that it was a a tool for self-expression. I'd always been interested in photographing landscape, and uh, water uh, was the first thing that I was able to really stare at without getting bored. And um, and so I've been photographing water since I started making pictures. But when I started to make pictures, I was a rock and roll photographer. Um, and that's what I did in the 70s. And, um, and it, got, it got kind of boring for me. I mean, it was a lot of fun, but the pictures all looked the same. And, and I'm uh, interested in change. And so I saw, I ended up say, seeing this person's work uh, Minor White, uh, whose work really kind of took the breath, my breath away. And um, it was the first time I realized that photography could be like a poetic kind of um, thing. And so anyhow, I went to school uh, at Ohio University in Athens, Ohio. I got my oh, okay. BFA. Is that where you went? Your Bobcat? Um, <laughs> And I got my BFA there in uh, 1979, and then I got my master's degree at University of Illinois in Chicago. And I went there specifically because uh, to study with a person who did a bunch of his work with water, uh, because water was such a big part of what I was doing. Um, And I just continued photographing the landscape, but as I photographed, the landscape, I realized that people are everywhere and our impact on the land is uh, very heavy. And I was interested in kind of looking at our impact um, as focusing on that. I just, I like the way people fix things. Well, h- how did you get interested in specifically photographing wastewater? So I had been photographing water and uh, for a long time but my focus was pretty much on, I was in, interested, like I had mentioned about the impact on the environment. And, um, and I was also a gardener, and so I had been photographing 
gardens because this was something that was interesting to me. And, um, and I did this project called Rooftop in where I photographed green roofs around the world. And I realized that um, we actually plant these gardens and these green spaces not just to sit and meditate and relax and entertain, but also to mitigate our carbon footprint. Right. And as I photographed that, I learned that some of the things that we were doing with green roofs was based on stormwater management. Yep. And so it made me wonder what happens when there's too much rain in this in these you know uh, impervious. Uh, Cut, you know, this concrete jungle, and where does it go? And usually, what would happen is it would go into our drinking water. So, a lot of times, a sewage would overflow into drinking water. So, I got interested in that and in the infrastructure. And, um, and then I saw this film called The Big Short, and in it has nothing to do with water. But it, it had to do with the uh, problem with the savings and loan and the uh, mortgage uh, over over lending. And at the very end of it, the person who kind of discovered this, Dr. Martin Burry, um, had talked about what he was doing, and he and it said that he was putting all of his resources into water. And at that point, I was interested in infrastructure, and since I lived in Chicago. Um, I was interested in getting into the deep tunnel, and so I contacted some people, and I was able to get into it. And I just found that, you know, wastewater is something that we never think about that, you know, do, where does it go? What happens to when you flush the toilet? What happens to the things that you flush down the toilet? And does it just go into like a magic garbage can or <laughs> what happens? And most people don't ever think of that. But what happens is it goes back into waterways. Right. It goes back into our drinking water. And my past work on sustainability kind of brought me back to that. And I realized that, you know, what goes into the earth goes back into us and, us and what comes out of us goes back into the earth. And so I was interested in that. And um, when I began to research that and found that wastewater was, you know, not ma it didn't magically disappear, um, but it magically became new water that we used, uh, that we would reuse for drinking and for um, other things like agricultural. And, and I realized that in Chicago, we have, uh, where I live, we have one of the, um, one of the most incredible combined sewer systems uh, in the world. And there's over 700 different cities around that use combined sewer systems. Um, and so I was interested in learning about that. And that's how I use my photography is to learn about a subject I'm interested in. So was Chicago your first site where you went and filmed wastewater? Or it was. It was my. It was the first site. Yeah. I knew somebody who, an engineer who worked um, on the deep tunnel, and I asked him if he could introduce me to somebody, and he did. Um, and I didn't reach out to them until the light bulb kind of popped up in my head. And uh, when I did uh, start, I started with the deep tunnel and um, a couple of Chicago's wastewater facilities, the O'Brien plant and the Stickney plant, to name a few. Um, and it was really interesting to me because, you know, like uh, rooftop and like green roofs, what we do is we mimic nature in order to kind of, um, in order to fix things uh, because nature does that automatically, but it takes lots and lots of years. And so it was interesting to see that we did the same thing with the microbes and the filtration using sand and gravel and uh, light, ultraviolet light to disinfect things. And I liked that we were using those things. And so I, focused, I started in Chicago. I start everything in Chicago usually because that's where <laughs> I'm from. I think a lot of people don't realize like how beautiful some of those old tunnels are. Can you talk a little bit about like what you saw down there? Well, in the tunnels that, you know, in the tunnels that were um, offline, you, you would say, mm -hmm. um, 
were not uh, hadn't been used yet. Um, it was really interesting just to see how they blast. Like in Illinois, we've got all this limestone, and so they would go like maybe 400 feet below, and they would blast it. And then what they would do is they'd kind of sculpt out, and then they would put some uh, sort of uh, you know, like not membranes, but they would build uh, an inner skeleton per se to house the water. And they would use that um, so it would come out. And um, it's pretty brilliant because, you know, when things, when the tunnels, you know, they're winding around and it's, and it's almost not a cave because it's chiseled out and it's really well, well um, done. But uh, it's, it's interesting because the you know they figure out how to kind of like hold the water in a holding place and then when they're ready to go ahead and start to purify it it goes into the wastewater plants so i was i did see them before they went online and when they were offline to be repaired which was pretty interesting to me but what what struck me was how simple it was you know it's just so it's there's it's just a very simple pro. I mean, a very simple way of approaching it um, for something which is really complicated that most people don't ever think about. I'm really impressed that you know all the water wastewater lingo. You speak like you're one of our engineers. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I learned. You know, I mean, this was the thing that um, when I do a project, I become immersed in it, and. Um, and you have to learn those things because if you don't, you can't talk to the people who are building it. Um, and so even in my book, I had put a glossary of terms so people would understand what, you know, what an effluent or what, um, you know, uh, you know, what the oxygenation was and why, why there was aeration and whatnot. And it was, it was just really interesting to learn about. And, you know, it's just, it's these things are so simple that you never think about them, but, you know, engineers put them to work and they, they make them where it's, it just follows the laws of nature. Yeah. Wastewater is certainly one of those taboo topics that people just don't want to talk about and don't want to think about. <laughs> yeah. I always get the question, mind. like, did it smell? Um, you know, <laughs> those kind of things. And it doesn't really, I mean, there's some spots that smell, but you know, the dangerous stuff is the stuff that doesn't smell, you know, <laughs> that's when it's dangerous. Otherwise, if it smells, that just means that it's, you know, water. I mean, yeah. it's alive. Mm -hmm. So then how did you keep going to uh, photograph m different plants? How did you choose the plants? And is this something that I saw that you had were awarded a, a Guggenheim fellowship yeah. work? So how does that work? Well, so the way I chose the plants that I was, um, the way I got interested in different cities was to find out what they were doing, how, it, how they were meeting the challenges of wastewater and drinking water and, and replenishment. And so you know, um, Seattle has got an incredible watershed, so I was really interested in that. And I am a friend of mine in Chicago, actually one of the commissioners from MWRD, had introduced me to Mami Hara. <laughs> and when she had heard about uh, what I was doing, she was interested. And she said, yeah, come, come down here or come out here and see it. I got interested in um, Phoenix because of the challenges they face with drought and um, the the hundred year drought that they're facing, uh, and so they have to sit there and um, figure out how they're going to replenish their aquifers. And um, Catherine Sorensen was doing some things that I thought was interesting, so I researched her um, in Los Angeles. You you know you hear about the aqueduct and and the long history of water and bringing it. And so that's why I chose that. And Philadelphia, because it's one of the oldest cities, and I love Philly. And um, and actually, I called that commissioner cold, Deborah McCarthy, and who's just an incredible person. 
And, you know, all of these people, a lot of the commissioners and people that be, got higher up, they started from the bottom and they learned their way up. And there was such a sense of collaboration in the industry that that was sort of, that really got me um, turned on and, um, and I got very interested in it. So when I went and um, the Guggenheim is this award that it's a once in a lifetime award. And what it is is to kind of celebrate a person, whether it's an artist or an ecologist or an economist or a scientist or an attorney who has been doing something um, that's been important in their field. And then what they're doing, what they're planning on doing, what they're doing at that moment and what the committee or what the foundation thinks uh, will be something that's significant in the future. And so they support that. And then what they do is they um, give you the resources, um, which is pretty much money, to go ahead and take time to just concentrate on that. And my, um, my project proposal was to talk about the magic that happens in the transform in the transformation from sludge to pure. So it was amazing to me to see that, you know, toilet waste, you know, shite and, <laughs> and urine and all kinds of ugly, terrible things that we wouldn't be near. It gets replenished. And there's like this magical transformation that happens before it becomes clear yep. and drinking water. And I thought that if I could kind of show that or show the beauty and the surreal quality of it visually, I would seduce people into learning about water so they could then make their own decision. Because my philosophy is that um, information is what gives power. And and it, and when people have information, they usually make the right choices. But if they have bad information, which we see every day on Facebook and and those kind of um, platforms, they don't make intelligent decisions. So my intent was to get people so interested in wa water. Um, wastewater um, use and also water use that they that I would become an advocate for conserving water, which is something nobody ever thinks about. I mean, we don't think about water. We don't think about oxygen. Without those two things, we wouldn't be around. In fact, when people go looking for, you know, in the planets, they're looking for water. And the reason why they look for water is because where there is water, there is life. Have you gotten feedback from people who have viewed your photos or read your book where you've opened some eyes or people have said, wow, I didn't understand that or I didn't realize what was happening? Actually, yes, from people in the industry and people outside of the industry. Um, the people outside of the industry, they, they just say, God, I'd never thought that that could be beautiful. You know, I never thought that sludge or that, you know, that feces would be interesting to look at. Um, but beauty is my sharpest tool. So I use that to get people to look at things because you're not going to look at something that's ugly. You're only going to look at something which is attractive or shocking. And I'm not really the shocking kind of person. Um, and then people in the industry, which was really um, really sad. It, it gave me a lot of satisfaction. They, they thanked me. People would thank me and they'd say, you know, I see this every single day and I never looked at it like that. And it's so nice to see somebody celebrating something that we do, which is so important, but mm -hmm. so under appreciated. And so by bringing attention to the ecological beauty of this process, I think that um, that's what they appreciated a lot. And then they would look at my pictures and they go, how, how, how do you see this stuff? 
<laughs> um, like I remember being in Chicago at the Jardine uh, water treatment plant for drinking water, which is very high security. And I had told every city, I said, look, you can look at my pictures because I don't want to have any sort of security issues. And he followed me and uh, was walking around. And when I set up my camera, I made the photograph and I said, hey, would you like to see, you know, what it looks like in the camera? And he's like, sure. So he puts a focus cloth over his head and he goes and looks at the camera and he comes out from underneath the cloth and he just shakes his head and he goes, Brad, I don't think we're going to have any problems with your pictures. Because <laughs> I was looking at like forms and shapes and kind of relationships and and color and, and those kind of things. I wasn't interested in showing the workings of pipes and machinery because to me that's something which is foreign to me and not very interesting actually. Um, I was more interested in the abstract quality that was there. Well, I've got a copy of your book sitting here and the photos really are quite beautiful. Thank you. So when you go, when you go into a plant, um, do you have somebody that usually accompanies you? Um, I usually, you know, for when I go into some cities are different than other cities. Um, but usually I would be accompanied into the plant. And then as they got to know me, they would sort of leave me alone and just say, let me know when you're ready to come out. Um, when there was a confined space, I needed to have someone with me, of course, and I was trained to go into those spaces, how to use the meters and, and kind of what to watch out for. Uh, but at the same time, they, a lot of people, they, they, if they didn't know me, I was accompanied all the time, but I didn't, it didn't bother me because they just would let me do whatever I wanted anyway. Right. Um, once, once they vetted me and saw that I was okay. Um, and they wouldn't have allowed me in the plant if they didn't think that I was okay. Like if they thought that I was not sincere and if they weren't interested in what I was doing, they probably wouldn't have, um, given me permission in the first place. But yeah, I, I also enjoyed having someone with me because I could ask the questions about right. things like lingo and, you know, like, what does this do? Why is this here? What happens if it's not there? Um, and those kind of things. So, because so, it was, it was weird being like in a sewer or whatever. <laughs> yeah. So when you go into a plant, do you have, you've been in a, quite a few now, do you have like favorite um, components of the plant or architecture that you're like, I'd love to photograph that particular element? You know, I don't have any sort of preconception because the way I make pictures is it has to do with the moment that I'm in. It has to do with the moment of light, right. you know, when there's good light or if there's not good light. Um, it has to do with uh, what I photographed before because I don't ever like to repeat myself. Um but to give an example, like when I was in Chicago, I photographed an empty aeration tank and it looked like piano keys. And it was really interesting to me. You know, it looks like a um, in an aquarium, the fish tank on the bottom, the filtration. So it's got those sort of piano key kind of filtration. When I was in L.A. by Hypernium, there was an empty aeration tank and they were discs. And that was really kind of interesting to me. So I had asked, I said, so can, can I go down there? And I went down the ladder. I brought my equipment with me. And I'm literally walking, you know, on pipes with my equipment because, you know, you couldn't really walk down in the soot where you could, but you really didn't want to. And I balanced on the pipes and I set my camera up. And actually, the person I was with, she uh, photographed me from above because she wasn't going down there. <laughs> and it was, you know, and I'm got my hard hat on and everything. And so, so like when I see a different aeration tank, I want to photograph that because it's different. But I don't know. I don't do research into what 
the plant has because most of the plants have got the same components. They've got effluent tanks, they've got um, aeration tanks, they've got the second effluent and, you know, those kind of things. So, I mean, they, that's all pretty much the same process. They just do things maybe a little differently. Um, they might have a, you know, like one plant might have been newer than the other, so they have different equipment, but it does the same thing. And, um, you know, it just depends at the moment when I see it. Um, I've seen like an affluent tank that was flowing and it looked like a, a Zen pool and it was really, really peaceful and interesting. And the way I photographed it was like a Zen pond. You know, that was how I made the picture. Um, so, and then there's one picture that I was in Philly and I went to this old sewer. It was a Mill Creek sewer. And um, it's one of the oldest sewers. It's all brick. Oh, and yeah. I so, think I saw that some of those photos. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's yeah. the first one in the book, actually. And, um, and what was interesting was the light that was coming down, they wanted to lower me down that to get into the sewer. And I was like, no, that's not happening because I wasn't <laughs> going to be in a you know, going around in a um, harness. So what we did was we found another opening and I climbed down and I walked through the sewer to that spot. And then they lowered my camera equipment down from, you know, where they were going to lower me down. And it was such a magical moment that that's what I photographed, that light coming in. And it was a, you know, kind of, um, kind of amazing really the the light that was happening and and um and just to be able to see the brick and everything and and where it was like you weren't sure what it was uh, but as soon as you see sewer you go oh wow he's in a sewer you know and yeah um, those brick was, tunnels are just beautiful i love the old brick tunnels yeah yeah they're great they really are yeah i like that you're using art to educate people it's it's yeah. great Thanks. Thank you. So do you have a favorite plant that um, out of all the ones you've looked at or the different locations you've gone on? I have a few favorites. Um, you know, O'Brien in Chicago is one of my favorite places. Um, I really like that because it has everything, the, the, um, the screening room where they, where they like screen all the garbage is really interesting. Um, the ultraviolet light uh, disinfection area is, and it's one of the only places that do that because most of the time they use chemicals. Um, and I just, I, and I just like everything about that plant and it, and it was pretty easy to get around. I loved uh, Los Angeles and Somar um, with the shade balls and, you know, that's a, purification plant not a wastewater plant right. but the hypernium is pretty cool uh and i really love in philadelphia i thought philly had some great plants and um one of the plants where they house the pure water the water that right before it goes into the chlorine you know before it comes to the um, faucet they have like this it's covered completely and when you open the door it looks like you can walk on the floor, but actually that floor is just the water and it's, which is about 20 feet deep. So Ooh. you can't, yeah. If you dropped anything, like if I dropped a lens cover in it, or if I sneezed or whatever, they'd have to drain all that water because it's back. It's, there's no bacteria in it. So they would have to re repurify that water to get in. But the other plants in Philly, I mean, Philly's got some really incredible plants, and, and uh, I really enjoyed working in Philadelphia, too. Nice. So do you have a bucket list of locations that you still want to shoot? Well, I, I would like to do some more work in New York. I'd like to do some work in New York because of um, their underground facility, and it's also probably the longest um, place from between the Catskills and drinking water. I think that's really interesting. Yeah. Um, Los Angeles, I'm really interested in the uh, aqueduct, which I've been doing 
um, lately. I've been photographing the aqueduct and and that. Um, and I also want to do a bunch of wastewater down by New Orleans and, you know, because of all the flooding that's been going on for a long time, you know, the way they've been dealing with it is, is pretty extraordinary. So, um, New Orleans is, is on my bucket list. New Orleans and, and New York are two places I want to examine a lot more. Um, the whole I-10 corridor is really interesting to me. You know, from Los Angeles to Florida, that whole that whole bottom part of the corridor, and how they deal with the whole notion of um, stormwater and water management has been kind of a, a topic in my in the back of my mind for a bit. Yeah, it's certainly a different animal down there than it is like on the West Coast. Uh, completely uh, different issues <laughs> for sure. Completely different. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh. Um, but still the drought. I mean, it's not drought, but yeah. Yeah. It is. I'm guessing along the way you've met a lot of interesting plant operators. Sounds like you interact with them a lot when you're taking photos. Um, do they tell you a lot of stories about the plant and the history? Um, what kind of relationship do you develop with those folks? They do. They they talk about their history, which I'm really, I'm a good listener. Um, and then when they tell me, you know, about what was before, like in Houston, um, you know, they're building the largest, I think it's going to be the largest wastewater plant um, in the country. And that's, um, that's been really kind of interesting what they're doing in Houston as well, because they have the, the flood and the drought kind of problems to deal with, but um, where they put it. But yes, I do. I, I talk with uh, these people a lot and I listen to them. I, I do more listening than talking. Yeah, we talk to a lot of um, the operations folks just in our job and in doing the podcast. And it's amazing that most of them have been like there for almost their entire career. And like you said earlier, they kind of grow up at the facility and they work their way up. And, you know, we just talked to somebody a couple of weeks ago. I think he'd been there 40 years, you know, working at that same plant and just so dedicated to to their mission. And they see it as a mission of, you know, creating clean water and helping that water cycle and everything. So. Yeah, they love it. It's And uh, when I, when my show actually went to Houston, one of the things I had asked the museum to do was to give access to the people that actually worked in public works so they could see it as well. And one of the, um, one of the proponents of the exhibition was to show uh, where the sewage goes and how it becomes clean and the water source and how they, the two things kind of intermingle. Um, you know, they don't intermingle until they're clean. <laughs> but, um, you know, like in Chicago, we get our drinking water from Lake Michigan and the sewage and, and combined sewer uh, system gets purified and it goes back into the Chicago River, which has been engineered to go away from the drinking water source. However, that source become or that river becomes the drinking water source for New Orleans and Mississippi and, you know, cause it goes downstream. Um, and that's pretty interesting because that's a, a responsibility that Chicago has to the, to the South of, of us. And so they, it's good to see that they rise up to that occasion. Yeah. We're all connected that way. That's for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. We're all connected. And that's what sustainability is all about actually is not making things clean but realizing that what goes in comes out and it just needs to keep circling around otherwise you know we we die and i'm not talking about us as humans i'm talking about anything once it stops it's the cycle is over and it it just dies so this is what you know sustainability is about resilience and keeping things alive. Brad, we just really want to thank you for your time today. Um, this was fascinating. I, it was great to hear that you love water just as much as those of us in the water and wastewater industry. So we really appreciate your time today and um, you telling us your, your story. It's been great. 
Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. We both really enjoyed hearing Brad's stories today. I know Tiffany already has his book, like she mentioned, and I'm definitely going to pick up a copy as well. It's really been such a joy to see the facilities that he photographs through his eyes and to really understand his motivations and how he goes about picking those facilities and what what he actually photographs. I bet many of our listeners out there have their own engineering legends. We'd love to hear from you. Please send us your feedback, stories, and ideas for future episodes. You can reach out at info at brwncald.com. This podcast was brought to you by Brown and Caldwell. It's our purpose and our passion to safeguard water, maintain infrastructure, and restore habitats to keep our communities thriving. Until next time.